Welcome. Today is May 9th. It's a Thursday, 2019. My name is Mark Tapu. I'm the Director of Oral History with the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. And today is an exciting day for me because I get to talk to Susan Haig. Mm -hmm. How are you, Susan? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Tell me what your job is. I'm the curator here at the Lincoln Home. Uh, that means I take care of the house and all of the contents, um, the artifacts that belong to the Lincoln as well as, as other pieces that we have in the collection. Let's start with a little bit about the, the history and the origins of the house itself. The first part of the house was built in 1839. It was built as a one and a half story cottage. So that full second story you see was not there. Um, it was built by the Reverend Charles Dresser um, for he and his family. Uh, he was a local Episcopal minister here in town. And he actually performed the wedding ceremony for Abraham and Mary Lincoln in 1842. They almost got married here in the house, um, but at the last minute it was switched to Mary's sister's house where Mary was living at the time. Um, so the house was about five years old when the Lincolns bought it. Um, they, they had the contract in January of 1844 and they moved in May 2nd, 1844, so just a few days ago. <laughs> okay, Susan, how about we head on inside then? Let's go inside. All right, come on in. Thank you, Susan. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to start with, Susan, is a little bit about the entryway, because every room in this building is a little bit distinctive. So what comes to mind about this room for you? The first thing you see when you walk in the door is the stairwell. Um, and the newel post and handrail on that stairwell were the ones that were used by the Lincolns when they lived here. The thing that caught my eye, though, was that, that doorbell. The doorbell, yes. <laughs> the doorbell is, as far as we know, original to the house. Um, it was a very simple spring and pulley system. You can see that the bell is hooked up to some wires that normally there'd be a wire here that attached to a, a pole outside. So you just would pull on that button and it would cause the doorbell to ring. Was that typical of the day? Very typical of the day. Very okay. typical. And obviously the first thing that they would be concerned about for guests and probably for themselves or Mary would be concerned is taking the hat and coat off and uh, using the coat rack here. Correct. And the coat rack do did belong to the Lincolns as well. Probably one of the first things that they purchased when they moved into the house. It's a Gothic revival style piece of furniture, which is very popular in the 1840s here in the Midwest. And they moved in in 1844, 175 years ago. And uh, so that would have been one of the first things they would have bought. The other thing they would have done, if you had particularly muddy feet, because the streets were just dirt or mud, um, the chair is there so that you could sit down, take off your muddy shoes, and put on the house slippers that you had carried oh. with you in a bag. So I bet Mary especially was concerned that that happened. She was very, very concerned about that, especially with some of the gentlemen and their big muddy feet. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, let's move on to the parlor. All right. Let's do that. Susan, front parlor. Before we get into any details here, I, I've got a couple of general questions. Sure. First of all, how do we know that this is relatively accurate to what the Lincolns would have known at their time? We've got a couple of sources that tell us a little bit about the house. Um, the one thing we don't know about for sure are colors, but we do have a, a drawing from Frank Leslie's Illustrated newspaper that was done right after Mr. Lincoln was nominated in May of 1860. And that shows what the two parlors look like as well as the sitting room across the hall. We also have one photograph taken the day of Lincoln's funeral of the back parlor that gives us a nice clear view of the wallpaper. So. Okay, uh, what I'm looking at here, I mm -hmm. don't see the wallpaper illustrated, at least what right. the design of the wallpaper would be. We think the uh, artist ran out of time because this is pretty detailed wallpaper. But like I said, we've got the photograph from 1865 and we know that the tenants hadn't changed the wallpaper at that point. Uh, so we're pretty sure this is what the wallpaper looked like. There's flecks of gold in this wallpaper. There are flecks of gold. It's a little bit nicer wallpaper. Um, wallpaper was very fashionable, had been for over 100 years. A lot of it was coming from France or China. Those are the two main exporters. Um, and to have this little, the little flecks of gold in it helps to reflect the light. The lighting's pretty low in these days. So anything you can have to help reflect the light a little bit more. So is it just gold paint or is it gold leaf? This is gold paint. Um, it might have been gold leaf back then, but that would have been pretty expensive. And Mary was pretty economical when she was living here. So this probably was just gold paint. Okay. 
Well, the other thing you just mentioned was the lighting. Now, we've got good lighting here now. <laughs> yes. Something they would have probably never experienced. What was the lighting they would have had in the rooms at the time? Lighting at the time was candles um, or whatever you could get off of the fireplaces and the stoves. Um, there's no record of the Lincolns buying anything other than maybe a little bit of whale oil, which was another form of lighting, but again, very dim. No kerosene. Uh, natural gas lighting did not come here until the 1870s, long after the Lincolns were here. Electricity didn't get here until the early 1900s, so we're, we're a ways away from bright lights. The other curiosity in the room here is the fireplace, because it doesn't really look like the fireplace I would have expected to see. Uh, no, this is the popular thing to do at the time was, as you were converting to the more modern technology, was you would just leave your fireplace mantle and attach your fireplace straight to that. This is a wood-burning fireplace, um, a wood-burning stove, I should say, and um, very popular parlor stove of the time. The um, original parlor stove is actually up in Dearborn, Michigan at Greenfield Village, but uh, this is a pretty close match compared to the, the drawing. And probably was much more efficient in heating the room at a, at a standard rate. Much more efficient, much, yeah. You didn't need nearly as much wood to get a lot more heat. And it didn't all go up the chimney like a fireplace. Right. And again, Mary, Mary's pretty economical here. She doesn't have a lot of money to, to play with. So, for example, the, the horsehair furniture looks very elegant, but the horsehair is very durable. It, it really wears like iron, practically. So she had a very practical streak to her as well. Yeah, I guess it's, I don't know the first thing about horsehair furniture. It looks <laughs> awfully smooth in terms of the covering of it. it obviously, the, the craftsman would have worked with it quite a bit. Yes, yes. It's, well, it's very smooth in one direction. If you go with the nap, it's very smooth. If you go against it, it's like Velcro. Was it subtle or was it pretty stiff? It could be pretty stiff depending on the weave. Um, and if there was a pattern, you could get a, a pattern in it. These don't happen to have it. One other thing I wanted to ask you about mm -hmm. in this room is the curtains or drapes. I don't know what term would have been used at the time. Either is fine. And they also look very heavy and ornate. And with you, when you talk about not having very much light, it strikes me that that's not helping the situation. <laughs> well, there's a couple of reasons for the heavy drapes. Uh, because this was not used a lot, this, these rooms were not used a lot, you would close the drapes to keep the furniture and the carpet from fading. Um, while there was a, the chemical dyes were first starting to be used, so they were a little more stable, there still was a lot of vegetable dye in use, so, and that fades very quickly in sunlight. So you close up the, the drapes when this room isn't in use and keep it dark much like we still do now, um, just to help with the fading. Okay. Well, let's move on to the next parlor that we've got at home. All right. Susan, we're now in the rear parlor. What would the family have called it at the time? Uh, rear parlor, back parlor. Uh, when they first moved into the house, though, this room didn't exist. Um, the front parlor was here, as well as a sitting room and then a large kitchen off the back. Um, but. The sleeping lofts upstairs were only about six foot six at their highest point, and I think Mr. Lincoln got tired of hitting his head. So they cut off the kitchen wing and moved it six feet to the south and built this room on actually as a bedroom initially. So this was the bedroom where at least three of the boys, well, the three younger boys were born here. Uh, little Eddie, their second son, died in this room um, shortly before, right after his fourth birthday, um, and they had the funeral in the front parlor. So at the time, they didn't have these big double doors. That was added when they put the full second floor, um, moved all the bedrooms upstairs, and made this a, a much grander space. When did that uh, addition happen? The main second floor uh, started in 1855, and then they finished by 1866, 1856, sorry, uh, putting on the full second floor. That's a long time in construction for somebody like Mary to have to put up with all of it, I would think. She did, but I think she enjoyed it. Mr. Lincoln was gone a lot of the time, so she was basically the general contractor while he was gone, which is a pretty big deal. Okay. Well, one of the things that you mentioned when we first went through here was an existence of a well. There was a well, like I said, when this, this room wasn't here, the well was kind of back in this area. There was a porch, and um, you'd walk out from the kitchen into that. And this was the actually outside door, so the well was kind of back here to get to that. It's still there. Um, it's filled, but it's still there. 
And again, candlesticks we're going to see in every room. Are there anything right. distinctive about this collection? These three candlesticks did belong to the Lincolns. Um, you'll notice they're a little bit plainer than the ones in the front parlor, but still nice. I mean, they still have the crystal dangly uh, pieces. Um, they're brass with a marble base, so they're, they're still nice. They're just not maybe the absolute top of the line. Well, here's a peculiar question. I wonder how long the candlesticks would last because you would be using candles an awful lot. They must have gone through a lot of candles during the year. They did go through a lot of candles. The, um, the lists uh, from the, the local stores, I, almost oh, probably every two weeks maybe, they were buying candles. Okay. So. Tell me about the items that are on the table. On the table we have a reproduction of Lincoln's lap desk. We do have the original lap desk. Um, it's a very popular uh, item that we loan to a lot of different locations. So we had a reproduction made. Um, so that we could loan the original out. We've got some papers from just around, around Springfield and actually mostly Morgan County, so Jacksonville. Um, again, more books that they liked, some of the newspapers from the time period. Mr. Lincoln uh, received five or six newspapers a week. He, just, he liked to be aware of what was going on in the country, so one came from Louisville. Um, several were from Springfield area. He actually owned a German language newspaper from here in town. Uh, of course, the German population was very high. Um, they were mostly up in the north side um, near what is now the state fairgrounds. Um, it's where a lot of them were living. And there were some in the neighborhood as well that he, he was friends with. You mentioned that he had a, a few or a couple from the Springfield area. So I assume one would be a Democrat paper and one a Whig paper? Uh, yes, he had both. The, as far as we know, he had both the um, journal and the register. Um, delivered. Obviously, he leaned more towards the Whig or the Republican paper eventually, but yes, he liked to, he liked to read as much as he could on, on all sides. Mm -hmm. And what's the box that I see on the table there? Oh, the box is his quills, and um, of course that is your only main writing instrument. Um, if you were fortunate, you would have a steel pen nib, but most day-to-day -day was just done with goose feathers. And I want to go back to your discussion about the lap desk. Yes. And I guess I wasn't aware that they had such a thing at the time. How would that be used? I mean, it sounds rather obvious, but how would it be used? Well, much like a laptop today, um, it folds in half. You, obviously, you could put the papers underneath um, to store them. There's also room for quills. There's room for an inkwell, um, wax seals that you could have used to seal it up. Fold it in half and stick it in the saddlebag and go on your merry way. Okay, Susan, let's head to the dining room. Let's go to the dining room. Susan, the dining room. Now, it might sound obvious, but how would the family use the dining room? Dining room, well, originally when I bought the house, this was one big kitchen with a fireplace on this wall over here. And like I was saying, in the back parlor, um, they wanted to put a bedroom on here, so they cut off this, and you can see the cuts in the, the joists over here, slid this over. Um, you can still see the remnants of the two outside doors. Uh, that would have led to those porches, um, which is why this is such a long window. It's the only window that does that in the house. But uh, when they added the second floor, Mary then later added a wall in between, so she got a formal dining room, which is something she would have been used to growing up in a lot more luxury and a lot more wealth in Lexington, Kentucky, versus Abraham Lincoln in his one-room log cabin 180 miles away. Um, so the dining room would have been used pretty much every day. Um, it's hard to imagine because the railings do take up so much space, but this would have been a very nice sized dining room for a family of five. Um, they would have occasionally had visitors for dinner, but generally you did your visiting after dinner. And tell me about the table and chairs that we've got. Okay, uh, in 1850s, <laughs> the Lincolns would have sat around this table, possibly. Um, it is a gate leg table in that the, this is only about two feet wide, and then the, the wings come up, can and so we, those can drop down. Can we peek under the tablecloth? Oh, uh, we chance? can try. <laughs> okay. So you can see the seam. So these, the leg would have swung like a gate to close, and then giving you a little bit more room if you needed it in this room. The chair, these two chairs did belong to the Lincolns as well. Um, they're called fancy painted chairs, or the, the brand name at the time was a Hitchcock chair because there was a Hitchcock factory in Massachusetts, I believe, that um, made this, this type of chair. These are not specifically Hitchcock, but they are very similar in style. 
and they're painted with, again, a little bit of gold leafing or gold paint. But By the time you get into the 1850s, Abraham Lincoln is a man on the, on the up. He's, yes, he is. And so I'm wondering, they must have been doing a lot of entertaining. How much entertaining would they have done here in the dining room for formal dinners? Uh, they wouldn't have done a lot of formal dinners. Um, would have done more of an open house um, effect. So you would walk in the front door, meet Mr. Lincoln maybe in the parlors, come through, grab a, a few snacks maybe here. Mary might have been in here or she might have been in the sitting room. Um, to help kind of keep people moving. Chatted with her, chatted with some of your other friends or whatever, and then out the door. So total time you could have spent here maybe as short as 15 minutes. But it was a C and B scene kind of thing. Um, For those kind of events there, I would assume there'd be some kind of food. Lots of food. And drink available. Yes, yes. Um, Mary was, was eventually very well known for her southern cooking. Um, which she would have obviously picked up while she was living in Kentucky. Um, she also had three of her sisters here in town to help her. Um, they would have loaned their kitchens, their, uh, their ice boxes, their pantries. They would have also loaned her their servants. Mary did not have a servant generally um, that would have been able to do this kind of serving. She would have had a kind of a maid of all work, but um, for the formal serving, she would have maybe had to borrow from her sister Elizabeth, who was married to the son of the governor at one time, so a little more elegant. I think it's time now to move on to the sitting room. We'll go to the informal parlor or the sitting room, yes. Okay. Susan, we're in the sitting room now. It strikes me now we've got a front parlor, a rear parlor, a sitting room. They all kind of look similar to me. How was this room used? This room was used a lot more often than the parlors. This was the informal side of the house where the family would gather after dinner. Um, we know Mr. Lincoln liked to stretch out on the floor. He would probably be reading a newspaper or a book aloud for the general education of the room. Um, Mary could sit over there by her sewing table. That's the best light in the house. It's a southern and a western exposure. Um, so she could do a lot of her sewing with three boys and Mr. Lincoln at any one time in the house. Lots of buttons lost, lots of torn knees, uh, holes in socks, things like that. So she could sit over here and do a lot of her sewing. Um, if they had people here visiting, Mr. Lincoln maybe wouldn't be on the floor, but they could entertain in here with really good friends. Tell me about the table here, the game table you've got here. Right. Uh, besides uh, Mr. Lincoln on the floor, the boys could have been playing. Um, they may have been wrestling with their dad or playing with the dogs or the cats. Um, they could have been looking in this. This is a stereoscope, and this did belong to the Lincolns. Um, this was... A pretty nice toy. It cost approximately $20 at the time, which for a family who maybe made $500 a year as an average, this would have been out of their reach. Mr. Lincoln was doing very well. He was basically the corporate lawyer for the Illinois Central Railroad by this time, so he could afford a very nice toy for his boys. Um, but you can see some of the cards on the table, and basically you put the card in, look through the eye holes, and it creates a vaguely three-dimensional effect. I mean, we kind of laugh at that three-dimensional now, but it's pretty exciting for them. So. That was, it's the early days of photography. It was the early days. And, and I'm wondering what kind of pictures then they would have been looking at. Um, well, some of the th things from around the world, um, we've got St. Paul's Cathedral in, in London. We've got the pyramids and the Sphinx in Egypt. Um, Niagara Falls was a popular topic. Um, but then we also have a four mule team from Springfield. This was just a local picture. Um, or ice storms or, uh, again, the pyramids. Um, so just different topics, whatever a photographer mm -hmm. wanted to make, uh, to photograph and then sell. And chess, was that something that the family would have been playing? We know Lincoln played chess. Um, we think he was teaching his boys because there was a head of one of the pawns found out in the backyard. It was broken. We only had about this much of a, a piece to go off of, but um, thanks to the World Chess Hall of Fame down in St. Louis, we were able to identify what the pattern was and get it reproduced. So this is based on the original piece from the backyard. How much time would Lincoln spend in the room then? Um, most evenings. He probably would have been here. If he didn't have some other activity, this would have been where they would have gathered just as a family. So he and the boys together and Mary would all be in the room together? And Fido and a couple of cats and maybe one of the neighbors if they were stopping by for a few minutes. Um, this room also is a very important room at Christmas. This is the mantle that they would have hung their stockings from. 
So no Christmas tree that we know of, but Santa did come and visit, and you can see there's still some nail holes oh, in the mantle cool. where they would have hung their stockings. Would this be about the extent of what Christmas decorations they would do? Most likely. Um, there wasn't a lot of commercial decorations available. It would have been um, natural things, so pine garlands and cranberries and, and uh, maybe some holly sprigs. Well, I think it's time now, Susan, for us to head upstairs. All right, let's go upstairs. Susan, we're now on upstairs. We're in Lincoln's bedroom, but I wanted to ask you a couple questions about our trip upstairs. Mm -hmm. And I noticed the steps seem to be a little bit higher than code today. Is that right? They are. There was no code back then, of course. So um, they, they fit the space, but um, they're kind of Lincoln sized. Agreed. They are a little taller than, than what we're used to. So well, maybe Abraham Lincoln size, but not Mary Lincoln size. Definitely not Mary Lincoln size. No, she may have had some issues, especially with her big skirt. Okay. The other thing I wanted to ask about, there is some space right at the top of the stairs there. Mm -hmm. I guess we decided to call that the sitting area, but it seems like there's a potential it might be wasted space, but I bet they didn't waste it. They did not waste that space. That is a, a good sitting area for Mary. Um, she did a lot of sewing there based on the pins and needles and thread we found in the floor. Um, it was also a chance for her to kind of keep an eye on the boys. A lot of times they'd be playing out in the street in front of the house and this looks out onto that street. So kind of child care and sewing. <laughs> and as we're in this room now, I'm amazed by how high the ceilings are. Is this higher than the first floor? This is. This is about a foot taller. These are closer to 12 feet. The ones downstairs are uh, 10 and a half or so. Um, partially for the architectural style to make it look right on the outside, but also um, some practicality. The heat, you know, heat rises. So in summer, it was a lot cooler if you had a tall ceiling. The heat could go up to the top, maybe keep it a little cooler down here where everybody was. Well, speaking of the heat, I noticed we've got some nice windows here, but the Venetian blinds was not what I was expecting to see when I came in here. The Venetian blinds show up in, uh, in 18, several 1860 photos. These are the only windows they show up in. So um, because this was a guest room, maybe they were trying to provide a little something extra for their guests. Gives you some ve ventilation, but also some privacy. Um, helps a little bit to keep the bugs out, but there were no screens. so probably not real effective on the bug situation, um, but very stylish. Venetian blinds have been around since the 1600s. They're in the room where the Declaration of Independence was signed, um, about the same color at one point, from what I know. But um, yeah, these were, these were just a little bit of a, a little stylish extra. Why don't you turn around and tell us a little bit about the bed? The bed is actually our only Lincoln bed in the house. Um, it did belong to the Lincolns. It's a, an earlier style, so this might have been something they purchased uh, shortly after they moved in here. It's a little short um, for Mr. Lincoln. Uh, he may have had to sleep a little crossways. Um, it's only about seven feet from end to end, so that doesn't give you a lot of space. But it's called a sleigh bed. It has um, a really nice veneer of mahogany on it. Um, so it's a really good piece. It's a nice piece. When you say it's the Lincoln bed, was that a bed that he had before he got married? Probably not. He was living with friends or renting, you know, renting out rooms. Um, and so he probably didn't need to have any kind of major furniture pieces. Um, so this was probably something that they bought once they moved into the house. And peeking underneath the bed. Yes. <laughs> Can you pull that out for us? Sure. It's heavy. Yes. <laughs> that is a chamber pot. <laughs> that is something that every room, bedroom at least, had to have. Um, if you didn't want to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night outside, which is the regular bathroom location, um, or if you were sick or for whatever reason, you had a chamber pot tucked under the bed. Um, that would have been the job of the hired girl then the next morning to empty it. Probably not her favorite job. <laughs> I would think not. No. Let's move to the Lincoln bedroom then. We'll, we'll go there then. Susan, we are now in the Lincoln bedroom, and mm -hmm. Lincoln is in Abraham Lincoln's room. Mm -hmm. And 
As I understand, we're looking out into the, in the front of the house here. And I know there's some unique pieces that you definitely want to talk about here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is Lincoln's bedroom. Um, again, the nice tall ceilings to go with the architecture outside. Also, probably just to make him feel more comfortable. Um, I mean, at 6'4", he needed a lot of space, but <laughs> uh, he was also pretty modest about things. So you'll notice that the, the pieces of furniture in here that did belong to Mr. Lincoln are, they're nice, but they're not elaborate. So we do have Lincoln's wardrobe. Um, it's a nice, solid, serviceable piece made out of uh, walnut. Um, it does come apart. The top comes off, the bottom comes off, all four sides and the doors come off. Um, so it could be transported if it needed to be. Um, and then put together again with pegs. We also have his chest of drawers, um, and we're back again to the little bit older style. Um, this would have been made probably the late 1840s, early 1850s, um, but obviously still a really nice piece. Um, not any of his uh, accessories, though. It's not his suspenders or his bow tie, just something that looks a lot like what he would have worn. Um, and then in the corner, we have his pigeonhole desk. And according to the affidavit, um, this was Lincoln's first desk when he set up business for himself, he said. Um, so it's a little small. Um, he probably would have had to wrap his legs around the legs of the desk to sit there with any comfort whatsoever. Um, but apparently it was, it was something he, he used a lot. Um, he later brought it home. He probably gotten a bigger desk at, at work. He brought it home and, and as far as we know, he worked on it here in the corner. Uh, where there, Neighbors remember seeing candlelight burning in these windows up till midnight, 1 a.m., a lot of nights. So this probably was where it was. Would you like to make any comments about both the wallpaper and the carpeting? <laughs> my thought is, boy, do they like things busy. They did. Um, the, the fashion of the time was called <clears throat> harmony through contrast, and they certainly achieved that here. Um, if you want to count the, the blues as the harmony, um, they do mostly match. Uh, the wallpaper in here is the original pattern and color. Um, now this was reproduced and put in here in uh, 1988. But um, this is a French wallpaper that Mary ordered, um, we think, from her brother-in-law's store. It's from the Smith store. Um, and this is what she picked out. <laughs> we have the original pieces. Well, we're right here at the doorway to Mary's bedroom, so let's head in there. All right. Susan. Here we are in Mary's bedroom, and I wanted to start this time with the mirror and the dresser and the wash basin. All right, well, again, we have a little um, bathroom area, for lack of a better description, in Mary's room. Um, we have the wash stand with, again, the pitcher and the basin. Um, and then we have a, a little foot bath um, that would have been used for most bathing. Um, Obviously, they didn't have showers, and we've never seen any evidence of a big tub or anything like that, although there were tubs available. Um, so this being Mary's personal space, she could kind of close off the room and do her whatever she needed to do as far as, as bathing, um, hopefully without too many interruptions from boys and hired girls and everybody else. <laughs> um, and we do have her commode here in the corner. Um, and I'm sure she's not happy that I always point it out, but this is a really nice piece. Um, it is mahogany, it's, so it's a little bit upscale. Um, and it would have, you would have taken the lid off, there would have been a chamber pot just like everybody else's inside, but the fact that it has a little seat makes it a little bit nicer. Um, and then the dresser. The dresser back here did belong to Mary Lincoln. Um, as far as we know, this is something she would have brought back brought with her from Kentucky. Um, it is a Kentucky made item. We've confirmed that with Kentucky Historical Society. Uh, they have another one made by um, a carpenter from the Lexington area. Um, it's again, a little bit older style. So this is probably made about 1818, 1820. Mary was born in 1818. Um, so this was something that her mother may have actually even purchased for their home in Lexington. So she may have, have uh, kept it for sentimental reasons. Her mother died when she was very young, and, and um, so she may have wanted to keep that just to remind her of her mother. It's interesting because those are curved shell or curved drawers that you've got in there. Mm -hmm. It gives you a sense that maybe their woodworking skills were better than we would have anticipated, even in those early years. They were very talented people. Um, definitely craftsmen. Again, this is... Uh, 
a tiger maple or a burl maple veneer on it, um, which would have been a little more expensive. Um, and yeah, the curving would have caused, would have needed some skill to create. What are the two crystal items on top of the dresser there? Uh, those are bottles that would have contained perfumes um, or some sort of scented oils. Uh, there is no deodorant, there's no speed stick at the time, and um, so people could get very um, aromatic, shall we say. <laughs> so a uh, lady might have used something to kind of combat mm -hmm. that as well. Well, we saw her foot bath here, and mm -hmm. when you're talking about this, how often would a family during that era have a have a bath, let's put it that way? Uh, that Saturday night bath night that we've all heard of is very much the case. Um, Hopefully the boys would have gotten baths more often because they would have gotten dirtier more often. Um, but generally once a week, maybe twice a week. Let's move to the boys' bedroom. All right. Susan, the boys' bedroom. Four boys. Yes. I know there was a tragedy during this time frame, but I'm wondering how even three boys fit into a bedroom like this. Well, three boys didn't use this bedroom at one time. So when they added on the second floor of the house, this was Robert's room. He got it all to himself. He was the oldest. And then his second brother, Eddie, the second, the second boy, had died when he was four um, downstairs in what had been their, their bedroom downstairs. Um, Willie and Tad were born after Eddie died. So there were only ever three boys in the house at one time. Um, and when they added on the second floor, like I said, Robert got this room. Willie and Tad, the two youngest, slept in a trundle bed in Mary Lincoln's room that pulled out from under her bed. But by 1860, which is the way we have the house now, Robert was away at school, so Willie and Tad shared this room. So. They slept in the same bed together? As far as we know, yes. Um, you'll notice there is no source of heat up here, not even a stove in this room. Um, partially because there's no chimney to attach to, but also partially because um, Willie and Tad being rambunctious boys of 10 and seven years old, I don't know that that would have been a good idea to have open flame in their room. <laughs> <laughs> good point. Well, let's start with the things that are over here on top okay. of this dresser here, the books especially. I'm wondering what the boys would have been reading. Um, these were some uh, books that were available at the time period. Um, an ABC book, probably more for Tad. Um, the Passionate Child is an interesting, um, very moralistic tale about a, a little girl who, who disobeyed her mother and her mother tied her feet and her hands together and set her on a stool as punishment. Something that probably wouldn't go so well these days, but um, again, designed to teach. Um, we've got books on um, some of the early math, algebra, geometry, and biographies as well that probably would have been more for Willie. What's especially interesting, though, is to see all the things that boys would have been playing with at the time. Yes. So we have marbles, we have dominoes, we've got chess and checkers, um, toy soldiers. Oops. Some of the marbles were found in the backyard of the Lincoln home. Not all of these, but some of the... Unfortunately, the, the dull ones, the clay, that would have been just extras at the end of a, the day for a potter. Um, they just would make some little marbles. And what's on this table then that's intriguing me? We've got dominoes, we've got some carved wooden animals that they could have played with. Um, the table itself did belong to the Lincolns. Um, the, the legs, unfortunately, the supports broke frequently, so they were often repaired. Um, in fact, the last time Mr. Lincoln gave it to the, the gentleman to repair it, he just said, keep it. They were getting ready to move to Washington, so it, it stayed here in Springfield. And there's a pole in the corner. Yes, a fishing pole in the corner. The town branch uh, wasn't too far away, just a few blocks south of here. Um, apparently that was pretty good fishing at the time. So I'm sure the boys did some fishing. Mr. Lincoln maybe even went along with them when he could get a chance, get away. Susan, the maid's room or the hired hands room is how you refer to it. Mm -hmm. What can you tell me about this room? This room um, is kind of an interesting room in that it's over an open back porch and the unheated pantry. So it's always cold in here in the winter, even with central heating. Um, this would have been a storage room when they didn't have a hired girl. Um, it would have been um, 
something that the hired girl would have actually enjoyed though, even though it's cold and it's small and it's cramped and probably full of a lot of extra things from the Lincoln family because she would have been, in most cases, she was a young immigrant, um, 14, 15 years old is the average, uh, from Ireland or Portugal are the two most prominent um, uh, groups that were coming um, because she had it to herself. So she didn't have to share this with three or four siblings. She had a room to herself, so that's not a bad deal for her. 14 or 15 years old, mm -hmm. not living with her parents. Correct. And is that typical that they would be leaving the home by that time? Very typical, um, especially if the family needed the money. Um, the girls were expected to earn their keep as well as the boys. And this was one of the best ways to do it because not only was she earning money, she was also learning how to, to run a household for herself. So a lot of the girls uh, would leave here and either go to a bigger house for more money or would go get married. Um, 16, 17 was a, a pretty average age to get married back then. How much were they getting paid? We estimate about $1.50 a week um, plus room and board. So that would have bought you a nice pair of boots. Um, a good, nice pair of boots was about $1.50. Um, or, but most of the time, if you were 14 or 15, it was going back to your family. Um, because in theory, you didn't have any needs. You had your room, you had your board. Um, if you were lucky, they may have even provided you with clothing at the house you were working. Is the wooden floor original? The wooden floor is original. It's the only one in the house, um, probably because this was a storeroom um, for most of its life, um, so that it didn't, didn't get banged up. It didn't really need to be replaced um, when the rest of the house was needing replacement flooring. So this, this is the original flooring, and it's the original color, too. Um, some paint was found under the floorboards, so it's got kind of this barn red effect. Mm -hmm. Let's move downstairs. Speaking of food, let's go to the kitchen. <laughs> Bet. When we were upstairs, I asked you if, if Mary was an efficient housekeeper. Mm -hmm. Was she a good cook? She became one. When she first uh, was married, she was used to a considerably easier life. Um, she had grown up with slaves who had done all the work and the cooking. Um, and then moving into her sister Elizabeth's house, her sister Elizabeth also had servants. So Mary didn't have to really learn how to cook. Um, apparently though, she was determined to, to do that. Um, she got herself a cookbook that's still up at the Presidential Museum and Library, Eliza, Lesby, Eliza Leslie's cookbook, and she taught herself how to cook. Um, Mr. Lincoln was not a particular, he was not a foodie, he was not particular about it, um, and it was very so, he was also very bad about getting home on time for supper. So sometimes the ruined meals were not Mary's fault, they were more Mr. Lincoln's fault. Um, but she became pretty good at, at basic, what we'd consider Midwestern cooking. Um, corned beef and cabbage, venison stew was apparently a favorite. Um, based on the bones we found in the privy, they ate uh, steaks, T-bone steaks, chicken, um, pork. So basic Midwestern cooking. How about the stove? What can you tell us about the stove? Stove belonged to Mary Lincoln. She purchased it uh, in June of 1860, right after Mr. Lincoln had been nominated for the presidency, um, probably anticipating that she was gonna be doing a lot of entertaining. So this was a very fancy, well, very fancy stove, I should say, a decent stove for um, 1860. Um, it cost probably about $20 uh, by the time it was shipped from Buffalo, New York. Efficient? Efficient for the time. <laughs> um, the st there's a st an oven in back. Um, the wood would have gone in here in the front. Um, actually, obviously a cooktop and some areas in front for heating and warming things like the irons when you needed them for ironing. And behind you there, is that a dry sink? That is a dry sink. Um, it is lined with a galvanized tin. There is a hole at the bottom where a plug, a cork would have gone. Um, so that when you got done washing your dishes, you would have had a bucket underneath, could pull the plug and then the water could run into the bucket underneath and then go out the door and throw it in the backyard. Was there any ice that they would have had? They could have had ice. There would have been an ice box in the pantry away from the heat of the stove. So you would have had to step across the, the back porch to the pantry. Um, there were several ice houses in Springfield with, as far as we know, Sangamon River ice. So they could have gotten some, yes. Let's go and check the pantry and then the backyard. Well, we can do that. 
we are obviously outside now, Susan. <laughs> yes. And uh, I was just talking about going to the pantry. Where is the pantry? Pantry is this little room off the, the back porch, the open back porch. Um, it had shelving in it, um, maybe a small ice box that would have had things that were kept cold. Um, but they didn't need to store a lot of food because the market was just a block away on what was capital was called Market Street. So it was it was right there. One thing we didn't mention on the inside was any source of water. Well, obviously, we're looking at the water source now. Yes, we've got two different sources. We've got a well over here that would have been fresh water for drinking and cooking. And then we have a cistern over here. And you can see how it ties into the uh, guttering system on the house. And uh, that would have been used for cleaning. OK. So when they were filling up their wash basins, which one would they prefer? So for washing clothes, they would have used the cistern water. What I'm especially curious about is if they had any kind of livestock or any kind of animals at all. Would they have had chickens in the backyard? They probably would have had a few chickens. Um, almost everybody did. You would have had a small chicken coop maybe inside the barn back here. Um, and they would have just been allowed to roam the yard, essentially. Um, that's why you have the fences around the yards. Um, they may have had a pig once in a while. Um, they definitely had a cow. Uh, and then they had horses. The horses were, did they have a buggy? They had a, they had a buggy and a carriage at one point. Mr. Lincoln would have used probably the buggy to go uh, on when he was doing the, the Eighth Judicial Circuit. Um, so the other one would have been used for the, when the whole family would go places. So we've got chickens, possibly a pig, a cow and a horse. That's a lot of livestock for a small lot like this. It is, uh, but it was very typical of the time period. Um, pretty much everybody had that kind of livestock in their house. Like I said, the chickens would have been allowed to roam free in the backyard um, with a coop maybe in the barn. The pig and the cow, the pigs mostly roamed the streets. You knew which one was your pig based on the notches of the ears. Um, everybody had their own individual one. Um, the cow and the horses, if the horses weren't being used that day, the cow and the horses would have been taken over, over the 10th Street tracks, which were, were there then and are still there now, to kind of the community pasture land that was beyond that to the east, uh, take them out there in the morning, let them graze all day, and then go back and get them at night and bring them into the barn. Would that be something the boys would be expected to do? Possibly. Um, the boys might have done that. Mr. Lincoln did that frequently. Uh, the hired girl would maybe have to do it. Or if they had um, a neighbor boy, maybe was going over to get his, he could bring theirs back as well. Was it a milk cow? It was a milk cow, yes. The outhouse. The outhouse. That's in its original location. Um, that is not the original outhouse, unfortunately. Uh, there were three different locations uh, in the backyard where we have found privy pits, as they're called. That is it's the last one that had anything from the 1860s in it. So that's the last place that the Lincolns used it. Um, this particular outhouse belonged to some farmers in Oakland, Illinois, uh, and they were friends of the Lincolns. Mr. Lincoln frequently stopped by that house when he was riding the circuit. Uh, so he may have used it in the, at some point. It is a super deluxe model, as I call it, though. It does have three seats. Uh, small, medium, and large. I don't know that you necessarily wanted company when you were in there, but if you did, you could, I guess. <laughs> do you ever get this question? Well, what did they use for toilet paper? We do all the time. Um, there was no Sears catalog at the time, so you used leaves, uh, rags, uh, and corn cobs. <laughs> well, it speaks to the eternal interest that the American public, in fact, the world has in Abraham Lincoln. I'll allow you to finish with this. How <laughs> important do you think this home is to America's legacy? Oh, golly. Um, well, I think it's, Lincoln is, is such an integral and such an important part of American and world history. Um, his whole focus, once he got to the presidency, was holding the Union together, which he did succeed in doing. And this house is where he started formulating those ideas for how he was going to succeed as a president. Um, but this is also a good place. You can take him down off the pedestal and make him more real to you. This is the, this is the familiar part. This is, this is Lincoln with his shirt sleeves rolled up, rustling on the floor and playing with a cat, you know, in his lap or, um, you know, helping Mary 
put the dishes away after supper and Mary's taking care of the boys when they're sick. This is, this is the part that everyone can relate to. This is a family man. This is a Lincoln Memorial Lincoln. Again you've, again, you've done a great job telling us this story and giving us insights in Abraham Lincoln. Thank you very much. Thank you.